All we can do at this stage is claim desperation. We've been under a cloud of smoke and ash, so thick the sun is just an angry red dot in the sky. It's been that way for a week. Every breath is a half pack of cigarettes all in one go. The heat's oppressive. It beats us like a hammer in a forge. No relief in sight. It's all trapped at ground level, and any more than a few minutes to let the dog out is to risk drying out and withering up. Between the smoke and heat, no one was supposed to be outside. But we braved it. We'd been stuck at home so long in such deplorable conditions that it was simply time to risk a venture outside, to other places, to seek contact with others of the species of man. Which, of course, isn't allowed in the current situation. In fact, just the day prior, it was declared we should all mask up again and remain distant from each other. Even those of us who received our inoculations were under the new directive. But we would not be deterred. We donned our protectives, took our proof of passage, and set out to complete our quest. We were going to go see a movie. In a theater. Something we haven't done since... Well, since Shazam came out in 2019. Unfortunately, there wasn't a lot on offer that we were interested in. We only have one movie theater left locally, and frankly, it's not all that great. We only get big-budget AAA titles and CGI children's films. It's rare that anything independent or even a little bit out of the mainstream comes along. Unwilling to see an animated basketball movie another Disney joint, or the sequel to a film that never should have been made in the first place, we were left with but one choice. And at the time, we didn't think it was going to be a good one, necessarily. In fact, we expected it to be pretty cheesy, and with good reason. But sometimes cheesy is fun. See, our thinking was led astray by a previous effort to tell the same story. Well, Two previous efforts, really both by the same director, Stephen Weeks. One a remake of the other. The film, Sword of the Valiant, starred a bunch of people who surprisingly continued to have careers after the public got to see it. Some of them, anyway. It stars Miles O'Keefe, which is the sort of warning that, if it were a weather warning, would have people running to the storm cellar as fast as they could. The prior film was made in 1973 and is fine for the time if you aren't quite aware what would happen to the fantasy genre of film in the following years. However, Sword of the Valiant from 1984 is practically inexcusable. It's hard to fathom who greenlighted this retread production, but among the many mistakes made was hiring Sean Connery to come in and chew scenery. And chew it he does as one of the main characters. If you've seen the film, and please don't take this as a recommendation to do so, Connery's spray tan, fright wig, and bare chested suit of armor are the least of your worries. But as we said, sometimes cheesy is fun. So it was with a fair bit of trepidation that we decided to go see yet another film based on the same source material. And what is that source material, you may well ask? Well, it's the subtitle of Sword of the Valiant, and it's the name of the film from the 70s on which that film was based. But curiously, only part of the name was used for the film we were about to see from the present day. Naturally, of course, we're talking about Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. And the new movie wasn't half bad. This is GM Word of the Week, and I'm Fiddleback. In fact, we enjoyed The Green Knight on its own merits, and it's entirely different from the first two offerings. So no worries there, go see it, but don't take the little ones. But what we really want to do here is take a look at the story of Sir Gawain and The Green Knight, and see what might be learned from it, and why it can spawn two entirely different films because we don't count remakes as entirely different. 
The first and perhaps most immediate question is who is this Gawain person anyway? And more importantly for us, how do you even say his name? Because the new film certainly has some ideas about that. In fact, when we first heard it pronounced on screen, we weren't entirely sure who was being addressed. To our ears, it sounded like Garwin. Even though for years, we thought the proper pronunciation was Gawain. Was this just filmmaker license? Or had we been wrong this whole time? Which, if you've listened to this show with any regularity, would not be at all surprising. The answer also turns out to be not at all surprising. Yes, but also no. See, it depends on which Gawain you're talking about, where you think he comes from, and how you think the name is spelled. The core of the problem is, no one, including possibly Gawain himself, seems to have agreed in any way on how it should be spelled and how the resulting spelling should be pronounced. Sir Gawain, as he would later be known, was in all probability a completely made-up figure. He appears in chivalric romances, which we explained a bit about in our jousting episode, as the close friend or nephew of King Arthur, again, depending on which version of things you are reading. The knightliest of knights, member of the round table, and general all-around good guy, he's even credited with certain supernatural powers and usage of the sword Excalibur, for more about which, see our episode which you should totally listen to, because it's going to make this next part a tiny bit easier to understand and will save us having to recount the entirety of Arthurian legend to explain that Arthur and Gawain were both pretty definitely Welsh. Which is where the real problem is, more or less. If you've ever seen anything written in the Welsh language, you'll be fully aware that all the letter forms seem completely reasonable to non-Welsh English speakers with no oddly shaped characters like you might get with Cyrillic or Greek. Everything seems clear enough, if a bit oddly arranged and shy on vowels. This is a trap laid by the Welsh designed to catch out the English. In English, there are letters that, when sitting next to another letter in a word, sometimes change the sound of those two letters combined but each letter is still treated as existing independently of the other. For example, the word enough contains a combined OU sound while the GH produces an F sound. However, in order to make those sounds, English did not decide to codify the OU or the GH as their own unique and independent letters. It was enough to say that when you see these sets of letters together, they are pronounced differently. We don't say in o g We say enough. Well, this wasn't good enough for the Welsh. Instead, their alphabet is made up not only of independent single letters, but also two letter combos representing their own distinct sounds. For example, the letter F by itself is the sort of F sound you get from of while two Fs appearing next to each other means the F sound in the word for, but not the F sound in the word phone, because that is its own combined letter, which looks like a PH. Which means, a Welsh word spelled E-N-O-U-G-H is pronounced enoig, or thereabouts, presuming such a word existed in Welsh, which to our knowledge, it does not though they understand and speak English perfectly well, we assure you. This is just illustrating the problem presented by similar alphabetical characters occurring in different languages. So, when confronted with a Welsh name spelled G-A-W-A-I-N, the one thing you can be absolutely sure of is that it isn't pronounced Gawain. It's much closer to Gawain. Though, obviously, Don't rely on us for your Welsh pronunciation hints. Except, of course, for one important thing. Pronounce anything wrong for long enough, and it becomes an accepted and correct alternate pronunciation. Especially if that pronunciation is being done in a language that is not the native language of that word. The English were perfectly happy to look at G-A-W-A-I-N and say 
Gawain. And so it stuck. See, oh, we don't know, maybe Sahu again, for an example. The other complicating factor is, of course, the inconsistency of spelling. Sure, if Gawain were spelt the same way all the time, then maybe a consensus pronunciation could have been reached eventually. But like so many other names way back in the misty times of legend, spelling was more or less optional. And once the Norman invasion happened in 1066, and the preferred language became French for all official and legal correspondence, English spelling was pretty much beaten to a pulp and left for dead. With Old English gasping for air, there wasn't really a chance to standardize the way words were spelled, and the folks who still spoke and used English just had to do the best they could to figure out how to write things down. It would take dictionaries to standardize things. Which is why, between Welsh pronunciation, English pronunciation, and the free-for-all that was spelling, you can find the name Gawain, spelled G-A-W-A-I-N, G-A-W-A-I-N-E, and G-A-U-W-A-I-N-E, which doesn't even take into account how it is spelled and pronounced in the variety of other languages into which the Arthurian chivalric romances were translated. Basically, it's a mess. Do your best. So there's Gawain, favorite of King Arthur, knight of the round table, courteous, compassionate, loyal, friendly young knights, a defender of the poor and downtrodden, rescuer of women, learned healer, possible owner of magical swords which might include Excalibur, possessor of superhuman strength that waxed and waned with the coming of the day and night, and a fighter to be reckoned with, especially just at lunchtime which seems like a lot to be going on in favor of just one guy. Also, he was reportedly next in line to the throne if and when Arthur passed. Or he would have been had he not been offed by his evil brother Mordred during an attempted sea landing. Or in a charge during a war. Unless he was killed by Lancelot in a duel. Unless he barely survives that duel, only to be struck down by one of Lancelot's friends. Except maybe he sailed away to Avalon with Arthur to be healed of their grievous wounds and decided to stay. Which is to say, Sir Gawain is mostly made up and his supposed history and interactions with the various knights and kings of the day are subject to interpretations that are vastly different depending on who is telling the story to what audience. Most all of it is just meant to entertain and sell manuscripts to a public that enjoyed these romances pretty much all over Europe. Very few fictional characters end up exactly the same as when they started out, which is fine and helps us understand a bit of what is going on in the Green Knight film. Of course, we could hardly discuss Sir Gawain and the Green Knight without discussing the other character in the title, the Green Knight himself. The poem comes from the 14th century and is of unknown authorship. It's the first mention of the character that anyone knows about. He is, as Gawain was, of uncertain character. In some tellings of the tale, he is sent by Morgan le Fay, Arthur's enchantress and possible fairy half-sister. At least, depending on what tradition you are reading. We're dealing with really old literature here, and much of it, also like Gawain, has been changed and molded over the years to suit the ears of whatever audience was there to hear the story. Anyway, Morgan Le Fay sends the Green Knight to test Arthur and his knights to make sure they're the best knights they can be. Or something. We're not too sure. Maybe she was doing Arthur a favor, maybe she wasn't. Again, it depends on who you listen to. In the end, it is Gawain who takes up the challenge and meets his fate at the hands of the knight. And since that's the plot of the whole thing, films, poems, and books alike, we won't spoil the outcome of a 600-year-old tale you should already know by now. Now, being such an old story, a lot of people have had a lot of time to study it and figure out what it all means. So naturally, there is clear agreement on this aspect of it all too, just like there has been for everything else so far. The reason the Green Knight is called the Green Knight is because, wait for it, he was dressed all in green. 
or he was all green skin and clothes alike, or maybe he just had a green banner. See? Easy. In any case, at least they all agree on why the night was green. Of course they don't. Why would they? Some think he was a figure from Celtic mythology. Others reckon he was a pagan Christian symbol, maybe even the devil, who was often pictured as green during the period. And again, as many scholars as you'd like to point at it, that many opinions will you have about exactly who and what he represents. Partly, this is due to the many and varied uses of the color green as an element of symbolism. To the English and other English-speaking cultures, green is often associated with nature, particularly the ideas of fertility and rebirth. And the Green Knight could certainly be a valid interpretation of the theme of rebirth, given the course of the story. So this puts the Green Knight, representing nature, up against Gawain, representing the civilizing forces of Arthur and his knights. But just as often, green is used to represent the forces of the supernatural and spiritual world green ghosts and the like. On the other hand, green was also the color of love and the amorous, something we today associate with shades of red. So maybe the green knight represents Gawain's greatest known foible, the company of ladies. On the other, other hand, green was also used to signify witchcraft and devilry because it was associated with fairies and toxicity and death, something we still use green for to this day. Mr. Yuck, warning sticker of poisons to children of the 70s and 80s, was a particularly virulent shade of green. Green also represented the transition between good and evil, the fading of youth, misfortune and death, and a bunch of other things. So it seems likely that even the people of the time couldn't possibly have known exactly what the Green Knight was meant to represent. Then again, Maybe the unknown author was just really good at picking his symbolism, so it hit the widest possible audience. Equally likely, maybe the green knight is green just because the author liked the color. Sometimes a green knight is just a green knight. But before we dismiss green as just the knight's favorite crayon, we do have to discuss two possible identities opened up just by way of association. And it's one of the most well-known and often seen figures almost everywhere in the world. The Green Man represents rebirth and the cycle of growth that occurs in the spring. Usually it's just a head or a face sculpted out of whatever material was at hand, shown peeking through dense foliage as decoration on a building. Though nowadays you're just as likely to find him on furniture as well. Basically, Whenever your fancy chairs show an ornately carved face surrounded by leaves, you're looking at a representation of a green man. The face would often be entwined in vines and have hair made out of leaves. Sometimes branches would be shown growing out of the various orifices of the face. Most often, he represents a nature deity of some sort, depending on where in the world you're seeing him. Or sometimes her. And a lot of people think he might be what the Green Knight was meant to represent. Partly this is because the Green Man has existed for centuries, and certainly for centuries before the Green Knight did. Some examples of the Green Man figure date as far back as the 2nd century from in and around modern-day Iraq. He's a genuine cross-cultural phenomenon, and it's hard for the people who know about these sorts of things to say for certain whether he started out in one place and slowly spread as he was noticed and the idea of him was carried home by various travelers, or whether he was independently come up with in widely separated parts of the world as some sort of giant coincidence brought about by local traditions. Like we said, lots of belief systems have nature gods of one sort or another, and it's not a big leap to imagine one of them looking like a man with lettuce for hair and a broccoli beard. What does make things kind of curious, though, is the fact that the Green Man will show up in all sorts of church architecture for all sorts of churches. You'd think carving potentially pagan symbols into the door frame of your local church would be frowned upon, but that doesn't seem to be the case. His popularity really took off starting in the Renaissance, when he got worked into books, manuscripts, stained glass, and metalwork, and kept right on going until it really peaked in the late 19th century with the Gothic Revival. By then, though, it was mostly just a form of decoration with no particular significance to most people. 
Even into the 20th century, you could still find his face carved into the wood and stone of modern-day religious buildings just as if he belonged there. We suspect, though we have no real proof, that because the Green Man was linked to rebirth, this gave him a free pass in among the architects of Christian churches. Because of the resurrection, you see. The other interesting possibility, which crops up in both stories about the Green Man and as a potential candidate for the Green Knight, is the Islamic figure Kidr, or al Qadir. Qadir turns up in the Quran as the smartest man around. He's a messenger, prophet, slave, or maybe even an angel of some sort. He knows so much he even foresees the future consequences of his own actions. But he's something of a cipher to those around him who can't quite figure out why he is doing what he is doing most of the time. In the Quran, he spends some time hanging around with Moses and confounding him so much that they eventually have to part ways because Moses keeps asking too many questions in an effort to figure out the meaning behind Kadir's actions. In one instance, he sinks a man's boat on which they have both taken passage, which Moses questions. Turns out, Kadir knows that the tax man cometh and sinks the boat to avoid the owner having it confiscated by the king, fully expecting him to repair it later. Well, three rounds of what did you do that for would be enough for anyone, we expect, and Kadir sends Moses off on his own after explaining that just because a thing looks evil or wrong doesn't mean that in the grand scheme of things it actually is. Up to and including killing a young man so his parents can have one that is better behaved. So let that be a lesson to you all. Kadir is such a popular figure that he gets into all sorts of traditions and beliefs in and around the Middle East, and in spite of hanging around with guys like Moses and the prophet Elijah, there are many folks who are quite content to believe that Kadir still exists and can be found walking around to this day, and attending an annual party during Ramadan with his buddy Elijah. Which means that, during the time of the Crusades, it's fairly likely that European knights and the rest of the army would have heard stories about Kadir and his exploits. And so, of course, they would have brought those stories back home with them to tell around the fire of an evening. And probably, things would have been embellished a bit in the telling. Until, eventually, the stories would have merged and become part of Arthurian legend and subsequently the chivalric romances of the day. We're speculating, of course. But it is true that in one of the later tales about the Green Knight, he is seen as more of a friendly, if a somewhat frightening, companion of King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table, and his usual role is to test and judge the knights to find them worthy, much like he does to Gawain. A similar role to the one of advisor, credited to Kadir in the myths that associate him with Arthur. Oh, and it probably helps more than a little that Kadir's name in Arabic has been traditionally translated as the Green or Verdant One. Whatever interpretations the tale of Sir Gawain and the Green Knight is open to, and whatever its themes are, depending on which version of the story you know, one thing we think is certain. When Arthur's best, bravest, and most chivalrous knight met the highly symbolic green-colored knight, with all the ideas of fertility, rebirth, death, nature versus civilization, the supernatural, love, witchcraft, transitions, fading youth, and perhaps even the growing influence of Islam in Europe, one thing was certain. Change was coming. Thank you for listening to this episode of GM Word of the Week. We enjoyed seeing the Green Knight on the big screen, so maybe you will too if you get the chance. We've got a new show in the works, which we aren't entirely prepared to tell you about just yet, but we can say that it's a fair bit different than this one. We think you'll like it, though, once you know a bit more about it, which you will in the coming episodes. Once again, a big shout of thanks goes out to our patrons on Patreon. For 291 shows, they have been ardent supporters who have made, in more ways than one, this entire show possible. We thank them for it. Without their contributions, this would all have come to a close years ago. 
If you'd like to join them, head over to our support page at gmwordoftheweek.com and see what your options are. This episode was researched, written, and produced by Brian Casey, who has discovered that his local theater has changed quite a bit. But the people in it haven't. Thanks, self-narrating lady. Music was provided by Blue Dot Sessions. Tell me a tale of yourself so that I might know thee. I have none to tell. Yet. You have none to tell. Yet. Yet.